Hey, salutations, everybody. Hello, Internet. What's up, everybody? It is we, your favorite hip-hop podcast, the Perspectives Podcast. We are your hosts. My name is Liddy Bro Flacco. Uh, my co-host here, Holden Stefan Roy. Holden, say hi, Holden. Hi, Holden. There we go, <laughs> my guy. I, always with the always with the on cue. <laughs> and today we have a very special, very, very special guest who I have been hitting up uh periodically to see if we'd be able to get on the show because uh I was really hoping to have her on the show for uh quite some time now. A legend, a, a New York City indie legend. Um Met a uh, former member of the Polyrhythmatics, um, uh, Queens vet, um, entrepreneur, uh, uh, all around God MC, a Pony B Fly MC. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate y'all having me here this evening. And I love oh, the no, intro. We, Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for taking time out. I know you're a very busy woman. Um, so we appreciate every minute that you that you give us. Um, we gonna hey. cut straight to it, right? So like, yeah. so we, we do our origin story every show because I think it also right. is valuable to like the guests to like know how right. this came sure. about, right? So like, uh, sure, yeah. uh, the COVID year, me and Jess James, you know, you know the bro, right? Like we were we were working on our Liddy Bros project and um, yeah. our engineer. Um, was a homie of mine from up in Montreal named Merker Miyagi, Merker Studios. And um, Merker might as well be from New York, right? Where like he has this attitude where he's like, yo, I don't promote anybody that I work with because I don't want to have to promote trash because sometimes I record trash artists, right? So like he never promotes anybody he works right. with, but like he promoted our shit. And that got Holden's attention. And Holden was like, what? Merker never shares anybody that he works with. So, like, that made him interested. So, like, he clicked on the shit. And then, like, he checked us out. And he was like, yo, this is kind of cool. And then he did an album yeah. review on our album. And I was like, what? You did a super cool fucking album review, my guy. We should do an interview together. He was like, yo, I was going to ask you that next. What's goody? And so we did an interview and sis, yo, I felt like I went to fucking therapy, yo. You know what I'm saying? Like, I really like the man mm. was like, like we talked about things that I just never talked about before interviews. And so like yeah. immediately typical New York nigga that I am, right? Of course, I'm going to do the, the oop, <laughs> like, wait, I did this. So now I got to put on all my friends. Let's do the link up, right. You know Let's what I mean? Right, so right, I was right. like, why don't we do a <laughs> show together? And I bring some of my friends to the table, and we talk to them, and we get to (laughs) no free promo, no free promo, no free promo, no free promo. We get paid over here. (laughs) (laughs) And so, but thank you for lending us the space. (laughs) Yeah, right. I was like, oh, but can so, you just turn down the music? Thank you. <laughs> hit them with it. I see that they did lower the music. That's gangster. And I was like, can y'all please turn down the music? I have an interview. <laughs> so um, we we did the, we did the show together, and it's been fantastic. We're on a year now, right? Yeah. And um, it's been it's been great, right? Mm-hmm. And so Holden likes to open up with his set of questions. But I like to cut him off, like typical New Yorker that I am, before he even starts talking. Gotta have that synergy, like, right? Be, you know what I'm saying? I already see the good cop, bad cop situation <laughs> going on right here. We got the, got the cool, collected, intellectual, quiet guy. And then, like, I know you, you're the crazy guy. You already <laughs> know what time it is. You already know. I come from yeah. the Bronx. I gotta be crazy. <laughs> so I've known you for years. Right. I already know what it is. <laughs> when you said therapy, I had a lot of commentary, but I kept it to myself. <laughs> So, right. Like, you probably needed that. But you know you I off did. The chain. Facts. <laughs> I did. So, um, I like to open up with, yo, why don't you tell the people who you are, yeah. what you've been known by, tell them where you're from, yeah. and then tell them where your parents are from. Okay, interesting. All right. So, um, I feel like I should do that backwards, right? Because if it wasn't for the, the elders, right? Um, so that makes wild sense. Yeah, uh, I'm a New Yorker, but my parents, uh, well, my mom, she's from the, she grew up in the Marcy. I'm the first generation. Me and my little, my cousins, we 
of my age, not the ones that came after us. We the first generation that grew up in houses, <laughs> you know, that weren't from the South. My, my family uh, on my mother's side is from South Carolina and on my father, my grandfather's side, uh, on her side from Charleston, on my father's side, like Tennessee, Virginia, like all, all my folks from the South. And uh, my parents were like the first generation to be raised in New York. A lot of them raised in Harlem, Bronx, uh, you know, um, Brooklyn. You know what I mean? And you know, we got to, they worked hard, bust their tail, gave us the bougie life in Queens. You know what I'm saying? So um, that was kind of my childhood. You know, um, my parents separated when I was um, Yo, we're gonna, in third we're, grade. Actually, so you know, my parents. Up, up, uh, no, we're good. We can hear you, but we got to stop because we're moving ahead. And trust, we're going to okay. go through your childhood with a little more detail as we like really get into oh, it. Oh, not now. the childhood? Fine okay. tooth all comb. Right, so, yeah. All right, so let me, all right, let me, let me pause that. But um, I'm that, from, and from then, Queens. So you I come represent from Queens. Queens. My, yeah, I represented my whole music legacy from Queens. That's probably where most people would um, know me from. Um, I did. I dropped my first record, like maybe around 19 or 20 or so. Um, I started out my first and record, my first record, but my first record what, I was on was with um, What would they know you by? Yeah. What would they know you by? A Pony B Fly MC. Um, a Pony B Fly MC. Fly MC um, is what I went by. I had a full official a name, wasn't enough. I needed a title. All right, we're going to run through all <laughs> of that with a lot more detail. Trust. And B Fly comes from a. Oh, okay. So I'll save it. I'll save it. Yeah, we trust. Like, it's gonna come. Yeah, it's I'll gonna come. I promise. Yeah, yeah. No, we got to answer promises. all that, but um, <laughs> I do like to start it off with like a, a little opening question, and it's a little bit of a story. Yeah. And um, basically, story question. Yeah. So it also it's gonna take a little bit when it lands. You can kind of take it in any direction that you want it to go. Uh, so with that, it starts with my girlfriend. Yeah. And she's washing the dishes one time. And she's got her phone out and she's playing the Black Eyed Peas song. I got a feeling. Ooh. She vibing. She dancing. She doing her thing. And I look at her and I'm like, when in the fuck did this song become chores music? And it was like this big moment for me because I can remember like 10 years ago how this song is like a middle of the night. Everybody's vibing, partying. It's like the highlight of the night. And then 10 years goes by right. and this song, it doesn't really like change at all because it's a song. But over the course of a decade, our lives evolve so much that now it's some music we throw on when we're working out or doing chores or some boring stuff so we can go back to like the happy vibes of a decade ago. And that got me thinking about the journeys of artists and musicians and stuff and the way that people talk about the story and the interviews and everybody and how we all start at this like adolescent phase maybe like 12 years old i started rapping or i'm nine years old and i first heard this or I, whatever and that's usually how people like to start the story but if we think about musical journeys that's not the beginning of the journey so if you come out of the hospital in queens there's a good chance that there's a song playing in the room and a little baby a pani be absorbing the waves off of that song now you might not remember that but i do know that our childhood memories are super impactful like i can remember being like five years old up in montreal in the apartment and my dad's got the gray boxes in the living room the freaking amp the preamp the radio the tape deck the wires going to all the different places around with that ghetto surround sound that we had in the room and in the daytime right, right, he'd right, be right. busting led zeppelins and things like that and at nighttime though mm -hmm. it's the club music that would be coming straight from the mc mario yeah. mixes and things and then on the other side of my mom's it was more like discos and musicals and love songs and this whole other vibe that came right. through and then there's the pop music and the disney's of my childhood and all this different stuff and it created this whole smorgasbord of sounds and things and these experiences that impacted me to this day before i had any control over what i ever listened to in my yeah. life so i was hoping upon it that you could bring us back to the youngest of honey you can remember being and tell us what it sounded like to be you before you had any control over it but keep in mind that most of us oh, yeah don't come from queens and we don't know what you mean when you go nah i mean you listen to rap music you know what nah means. no but we mean everything we nah know what means. that means but we don't know what you mean <laughs> all right all right so um i could definitely break that down I, honestly um i had a very early emerging in music and my my parents were big music fans my pops used to have a big eight track in the living room he probably doesn't even remember, know that I remember that, that he had the big eight track in the living room. And he had, you know, the eight track was gigantic. It looked like a, like a real to real, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we used to play like Stevie Wonder and all of these 
funk in the 70s, whatever was popping at that time. But my mom actually was an aspiring singer, which I haven't told anybody. I don't know if I've ever told everybody in the interview, or maybe I've said it many few times. But my mother was an aspiring singer when I was young. And she used to take um, voice lessons, sing like a lot of uh, show tunes, gospel. She would drag me with her to rehearsals, but it was like real deal. She was going to like a real vocal coach and I was a little kid, so I couldn't come in the room with her. I just listened from the outside. Um, and then she used to sing in like different choirs. She used to be like singing back up for she had friends that sang country music, all kinds of stuff, down with the blue note, you know. Um, so I, I had an early- um, The blue note downtown? Stuff. Yeah, the blue note downtown. And um, you know, I was a little kid, so I was to be like embarrassed, like in the corner or whatever. You know, kids, everything, our parents do embarrassed this way. Um, but um, my my entry into that was when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a writer, um, a journalist. And I used to write a lot of poetry. So, um, you know, and everybody used to tell me I was talented. I mean, people always encouraged me. I, I'm lucky that's how I was able to kind of get to the point where I could make a record because I always had people tell me, yeah, you're talented, keep doing that. So um, I used to write a lot, you know, and I used to read a lot, voracious readers still to this day. Like, I, I was like a kid, I'd be quiet in the corner with a book and a doll talking to myself, you know, stuff yeah, like I got that. A big so, question um, then. I was just kind of, yeah. What is like your top books from childhood? Uh, my top books from childhood? I used to like, um, I used to like those choose your own adventure books. When I was a oh, kid, oh, I you love them. Those? Shit. Yes, I love them. Yeah. Too. Yo, I used hours. to. I think I still hours. owe the library probably like thousands of dollars at this point. You know, I still they used to charge you. You know, they just used to charge you astronomical rates. That I'm like, yeah, 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 that's yeah. why. That's why you guys went out of business because you charge yeah. me astronomical <laughs> rates for these late fees. Exactly. But I think yeah. that I probably still got a few because I love them books. <laughs> yeah, I used to like those. I used to like um, I used to read the Hardy Boys. I used to read oh, um, yeah. like a lot of mystery, yeah, mystery books. Um, I, I would read the classics like Anne of Green Gables. I was reading Edgar Allan Poe, like you know, just whatever I could get my hands on as a teenager. I really like um, The Stranger, Albert Camus. You know, like just conceptual things. Um, you know, I used to read a lot of my pops was a huge history book. But if you if you look on my Facebook. You see, he'd be tagging me in a lot of stuff or look at his posts or whatever. He's always posting like black history, he likes some Native American history, he'd be taking the powwows and stuff like that. So I had a very, you know, like culturally immersive childhood. Like he was just into everything. And that's one of the benefits of living in New York, right? You get to touch a little bit of everything. Um, you know, so um, I was into all kinds of stuff. I, I'm encyclopedia, you know what I'm saying? You know, my parents would buy you the big encyclopedias and stuff like that. I would just sit. That's what I do for my kids now. Just sit, flip front to back, dictionary front to back. You know, That's what I, mean? wild. I, I was just, yeah, you know. Um, and like I said, they, I you go, you music. trying to make you trying to make sure that your your kids spell our O U R, not A R E and shit. Like I mean, any certain kid, shit that kids, I be seeing nowadays online, I'm just like, yeah. what happened? My, to my kids honestly are. Um, I feel like I was, I was blessed. Like I said, I put out like records and I, I discovered that I was an artist. I used to like to dance too. I would go party and I would dance, stuff like that. And you know, I had a little crew or whatever. We'd go to a party and like, get in a circle. Like what was that movie house party? You know, that was my life. But live at the barbecue, rapping at the barbecue in Queens. Like that was my life when I was younger. So hold on, but, when did you, when did, my kids are way smarter than me. <laughs> they want it early. My, my kids are already like, I'm an artist and they like, my, my son is 11. He's been saying he's an artist since he's like six. And my daughter's in like 10. And they, they got crazy skills. That's good, though. They're, they're, when you got an artist for a mom. You love science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they, 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 they connected mom, with it early. They're still in that. Yeah. yeah they they, they, they connected good. and have the self-awareness self early. You're not trying to encourage it, but, you know, um, they, they're real special. That's really yeah. cool. So, like, when did you discover, like, hip-hop or that you had, like, a, a love for it? Like, at what point in your life did it become more predominant? Um, well, like I said, maybe you go around junior high school. That was, like, the era of uh, banging on the tables and stuff like that. But, like I said, I did poetry. I used to write a lot. And then I, I can't remember what, maybe, like, Rakim or, like, you know, that whole Antoinette era. You know, I just started, like, writing raps. 
And then I started telling a few friends. In fact, my best friend at the time, one of the cats in our class, he used to make beats. His name is Carlos. Um, my crew back in the day, DMO, shout out to Life Ball, Hostile, and still around, whatever. Um, Carlos, I don't know if he still works there, but he used to work at Fat Beats or whatever. Eventually, I, this was pre Fat Beats days. There was no Fat Beats at this time. But, you know, we banging on the tables, and then my homegirl told him that I wrote raps. And he was like, yo, I you rap, yo. And we back in the day, we had a Casio. You know, these kids today, they can press buttons. We had a Casio. We used to make pause tapes, you know, when you take the, the loop and you play the record, and then you just play the loop and then pause the tape, and then bring the loop back and then pause the tape. So you made a loop that was long enough to rap while we were doing that in his room, in his basement, you know, in his pops house, he was around the corner from me. But, um, like I said, I was I was immersed in music. Like so, the, you know, I think when people think about hip hop now, I mean, it's big and across a lot of genres. But hip hop is really every kind of music, right? So, you know, I used to love jazz. I loved um, reggae. I loved, you know, my, my grandmother sang in the choir too. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, Mahalia Jackson, um, Andre. So there was a there was a there was everything. a strong so there was a strong yeah. church influence in the household growing up. Well, you know what? It, I want to say church, but you know, it's more like um, it's like spirit, soul, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Like my, the music. My, my uncle, yeah, I want to shout out my uncle Jerry too because my uncle he used to play um, when he was thirteen. My grandfather was pulling him out of salsa clubs because he was telling me taught himself how to play every instrument. So he could play everything except, um, I think he said strings or whatever. And he was he was very talented, like from from a kid. You know, so we had tons of vinyl records, and and that's what I used to do a lot when I, before I was even writing. I used to sit in the basement and play the records because I told my parents that his a track. My parents love music, so I was sitting out playing music. But sometimes I would feel kind of like I had this like sort of empathic superpower. I would listen to the record, and I feel like I was transported, like I was in the room, like a fly on the wall. Like mm -hmm. when the artist recorded the record, like certain people would do that to me. And it's funny that you was talking about like jazz, where you have somebody like um, what's her name, uh, Sarah Vaughan, right? Who, whose voice is always compared to an instrument, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I used to listen to some of these artists, and they, the the quality of their voice would mesmerize me. So when I did when I did start rapping, because I started saying like it's one thing if you can't if you can sing, right? You got somebody like Whitney Houston or Mariah Carey got all these octaves. But to be able to use your voice, right, when you're speaking, right, and it's just you as a rapper, one person in front of a mic, in front of a crowd, you don't necessarily have dancers, right, because you don't need chitlin circuit or what have you. How do you come in that room with just you and the microphone? And you have to use your voice as an instrument to sort of convey the spirit of what it is that you're trying mm -hmm. to make you feel and understand, right? So, like, people like Luther Vandross, Donnie Hathaway, like, the way they're able to wrap their voice around notes, Alita Adams, you know, different people, I would sit and I would listen to that record and I would feel like I was in the studio. I mean, this is, you know, before my time, of course, right? Like Donnie Hathaway, I think he died the year after I was born, right? But I, I um, used to sit and feel like I was there while they were recording the music, right? And, and be transported into that space. Bob Marley was another one of them because he just had, like I said, it wasn't so much about like the, 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 the gospel of it, the, you know, the genre, but it was about- It was a know, spirituality in the person. Right, I mean, it's, it's not in like the, it's, it's Right. And the, and the know, music it, and, the, and the, what right. they emote into the music, what and, they and put exactly, in it. That's exactly the correct word, emote. So that, that was always my mission was to try to, to, to try to bring that to people. And Farrell Mom said that to me one day. He said, he said, when you pick a beat, it should have God in it. You should hear God in, in the beat when you pick it, mm. which I, I thought was was crazy real, right? So don't you, um, you don't you love it when your artist friends say like the like the ill shit that you're like, mm, son, I'm gonna quit yeah. that forever, bro. <laughs> But, but, I think, but then I think you that, know well, them, and that's your friend. I'm pretty sure yeah. that Paro, I'm pretty sure Mancho is it like, you know, you know, I'm pretty yeah. sure he's not like philosophizing for the entire time that you guys are together. But and then he had that gem in the middle of you guys chilling. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, well, sort of, you know, he, he's a deep dude. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of <laughs> like that, you know, and I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, when you no, talk to you. certain people, 
everything that they drop on you is mostly valuable. You know, you have your light moments, but there's a lot of value in everything that they say. I'm gonna say like, I feel like that with about it, just about anything. All good information is transferable, right? Like if, if you get a hot tip, a lot of times you can apply it to many different, you know, layers and aspects of, of life. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? It, it uses it for many different things. A hot tip is a hot tip. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? There's things that I learn at work that I end up applying to my relationship with my wife and then Absolutely. or there's something that maybe like I, I I mature and I grow as a person mm -hmm. with my wife in a way and then that mm -hmm. now reflects in my work and in my personal relationships with all my friends you know what yeah. I'm saying so they, what what's applicable in one place in life doesn't just apply there it's I got, I got a bunch of those things that I that I employ all of the time, like a bunch of the little phrases that run around in my head all of the time that uh, mm -hmm. you know that get me through. <laughs> yeah, I like those. Um, I try to look for. The, that's why I yeah. love this shit where we get. That's why it's perspectives, right? Because all we're trying to do is kind of unlock right. different people's perspectives through their story.